Welcome to our quantum deep dive. Today we're taking a truly fascinating journey, really getting into the mind of a physicist whose ideas, well, they were radical. They reshaped how we think about reality itself. And laid groundwork for technologies we're only just starting to get our heads around now. Exactly. Our mission today is to dive deep into the life and uh, the groundbreaking work of Hugh Everett III. We're going to focus on his many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And this is all based on a really comprehensive essay by Jorgo Schnepet. That's right. So if you're interested in how, you know, super abstract physics connects to the real world, maybe even technology and culture, yeah, this is for you. Yeah. We'll unpack why his ideas were such a big deal, why people push back so hard at first, and uh, how they... And seeped into modern quantum tech and even pop culture, really. Okay, let's start at the beginning then. Who was Hugh Everett III? What kind of person sets out to challenge, you know, the absolute foundations of physics? Well, Hugh Everett III, he was born November 11th, 1930 in Washington, D.C. Oh. And apparently, right from a young age, showed this uh, amazing talent for math and science. Ah, one of those. Yeah, seems like it. His childhood involved moving around a lot. His father was in the military. And some people think that maybe contributed to him being pretty independent, maybe a bit introverted. Hmm. Okay. So that might foster a mind that thinks differently. Could be. <laughs> Someone less swayed by the crowd, maybe. <laughs> anyway, he first studied engineering at Catholic University. Engineering. Interesting start. Yeah, but his math skills were just, well, exceptional. They pulled him pretty quickly towards physics and applied mathematics. And then in 1953, he lands at Princeton. Right, Princeton. Big deal in physics then, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. A total hotbed for quantum physics. Yeah. Yeah, giants there, like John Archibald Wheeler, who actually became Everett's doctoral advisor. Wow. So he's right in the thick of it. Exactly. And that's where he starts really questioning things, specifically this big puzzle called the measurement problem. The measurement problem. Okay. Break that down a bit. Why was that such a sticking point? So Everett dives into the work of Bohr, Heisenberg... Schrodinger the pioneers, he gets fascinated by Schrodinger's wave mechanics. But the dominant theory then, the Copenhagen interpretation, it bugged him. What bugged him about it? It was this idea of the wave function collapsing. You know, the theory said a quantum system exists in multiple possibilities, like a wave. But when you measure it, poof, it supposedly collapses into just one single reality. Okay. Everett found that, well, mathematically unsatisfying. And philosophically weird... Why should measuring it suddenly break the smooth, deterministic evolution described by Schrodinger's own equation? It felt like an arbitrary patch. So he's looking at what everyone else accepts and thinking, hang on, this doesn't quite add up logically. Yes, exactly that. He saw a fundamental inconsistency. Nope. And if his radical thought, the seed of it all was, what if it doesn't collapse? What if? What if all those possibilities described by the wave function just keep going? What if they all become real? Whoa. Okay. That was the beginning of the many worlds interpretation. Right. So here we get to the core of it. The many worlds interpretation, or VWI. What is it exactly, and why did it cause such a stir? Okay, so the VWI basically says the wave function. It never collapses, ever. Instead, every possible outcome of any quantum measurement uh, becomes real. Every single one. Every single one. But they happen in parallel, sort mm -hmm. of non-overlapping universes. Mm -hmm. Think of it like the universe constantly splitting, branching off into countless alternative realities with every quantum event. So that classic example, the particle that can be spin up or spin down, in Everett's view, when you measure it, the universe splits. One where it's up, one where it's down. Precisely. Both outcomes happen. They just happen in separate branches of reality. He argued that the fundamental equation of quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation, the partial, partial one. That's the one. He argued it applies universally, deterministically, to everything, including observers, including the whole universe. No exceptions. And the collapse. To Everett, that was just an unnecessary subjective add-on. He thought it broke the mathematical elegance. The reason we only perceive one outcome is down to something called decoherence. Decoherence. What's that? It's in simple terms. It's basically the process by which these different branches, these parallel worlds, effectively stop interacting with each other. They become isolated, so we only experience the history within our own branch. Mm -hmm. It's not a collapse, just a separation. Oh, good. That's a huge idea. How did the establishment react, especially giants like Niels Bohr, who is practically Mr. Copenhagen interpretation? Uh, not well. 
not well at all. The reception was largely critical, sometimes fiercely so. Everett presented his PhD thesis on this in 1957, The Theory of the Universal Wave Function. And Bohr. Bohr and many others just vehemently rejected it. They thought the whole idea of infinite, unobservable parallel universes was just too speculative, too weird, untestable metaphysical baggage, they called it. So they felt it wasn't really physics anymore. Kind of. They wanted physics to stick to what we can measure and predict. Everett was proposing this vast, unseen structure to reality just to maintain mathematical consistency. It was a phil philosophical clash, really. What did that rejection do to Everett? must have been tough. Devastating, by all accounts. Yeah. The lack of acceptance, the lack of interest. It led him to become pretty disillusioned with academic life. So he just left. Yeah. He left academia, moved into applied research, and sadly... This meant his revolutionary idea, the many worlds interpretation, mostly just faded into obscurity for, well, for decades. Wow. So a potentially groundbreaking idea just sidelined. Yeah. It's amazing then that we're even talking about it now. What happened next for him personally? He left academia. Where did he go? He actually joined the Defense Research and Engineering Group at the Pentagon. Quite a shift, right? From infinite universes to the Pentagon. Seriously. Seriously. He applied that incredible mathematical mind to national security problems. One big thing he worked on was the Minimax Doctrine for nuclear strategy during the Cold War. Minimax, like yeah. in-game theory. Exactly. He was building these complex mathematical models to analyze threat scenarios, figure out optimal strategies, how to allocate resources. You know, given the risks, it's about minimizing your maximum potential loss. So using probability and value... Like the, the VB design of you kind of calculations. Precisely that kind of thinking. Calculating utility based on outcomes and probabilities. Mm -hmm. It really shows his analytical versatility, applying yeah. that rigorous approach to completely different, very high stakes problems. It does. Did he stick with defense work? For a while, yeah. Later on, he even started his own consulting company, Lambda Corporation. It focused on mathematical modeling for risk management decision making, both for defense clients and commercial ones, too. Okay, so he had this whole other successful career in applied math and strategy. But how did his original idea, Many Worlds, make a comeback? It seems like it was almost forgotten. It really did seem that way for a long time. But after his death in 1982, things started to change. There was a resurgence. Physicists like Bryce DeWitt. The one who coined the name Many Worlds. That's him. DeWitt started championing Everett's work in the 80s. And then in the 1990s, it really gained momentum, especially with the rise of quantum information theory and, crucially, quantum computing. Ah, quantum computing. Now, that's interesting. How does an idea about parallel universes become a cornerstone for building these next-generation computers? That connection feels non-obvious. It's actually a surprisingly neat fit, conceptually. Mm -hmm. Quantum computers depend fundamentally on superposition, right? Quibits being in multiple states at once. Like being both zero and one simultaneously, that frac one plus one state. Exactly. Now, Everett's idea says those superimposed states aren't just mathematical possibilities. They represent equally real realities existing in parallel. Okay. So, a quantum computer exploring multiple possibilities simultaneously. From a many worlds perspective, it's almost like it's performing computations across different parallel branches of reality at the same time. That inherent parallelism is key. So the computer is literally leveraging the multiverse. Well, that's one way to think about it. And concepts Everett wrestled with, like decoherence, the very thing that makes worlds separate, that's now a huge practical challenge in building quantum computers. Understanding and controlling decoherence is vital for quantum error correction, for making algorithms like Shor's or Grover's actually work. So Shor's algorithm factoring huge numbers, Grover's searching databases, they rely on this quantum parallelism that Everett's theory kind of predicted or explained? In a way, yes. His framework provides a coherent way to understand why quantum computers have this potential power. He didn't design the hardware, obviously, but his interpretation makes sense of the underlying quantum mechanics they exploit. So he's like an unsung theoretical hero for quantum computing. Many people see him that way, absolutely. He provided this conceptual underpinning, even if he wasn't directly involved in building the machines. And beyond the serious physics and tech... It's amazing how this stuff has seeped into popular culture. The multiverse is everywhere. Oh, completely. It's a massive trope now, isn't it? Directly inspired by many worlds. You see it in movies like Everything Everywhere All at Once. Brilliant film. Yeah. Or Interstellar, with its grand cosmic themes. Even TV shows like Rick and Morty just run wild with the idea of infinite, 
often bizarre parallel universes. Right. It makes these incredibly complex ideas feel accessible, maybe even fun. Exactly. It bridges that gap. Popular culture has definitely helped bring Everett's mind-bending concept to a much, much wider audience than physics journals ever could. So let's try and sum up. How should we view Hugh Everett III today compared to Bohr, Schrodinger, the founders he kind of challenged? I think he stands out as incredibly courageous and visionary. Bohr and Schrodinger laid the foundations, absolutely. But Everett, he dared to take a totally different fork in the road. Yeah. He proposed something mathematically clean, universal, that didn't need this awkward wave function collapse. Mm. And his insights, especially around decoherence, were just decades ahead when they became experimentally relevant. He saw where the math led, even if it seemed bizarre. Right. He followed the logic, even when it led to, well, infinite universes. But it's not like everyone just accepts many worlds now, is it? Are there still major criticisms? Oh, definitely. The VWI isn't without its challenges. The biggest one is probably still experimental verifiability. How do you prove infinite universes exist if you can't see them? Exactly. Many worlds makes the same predictions for any given experiment as Copenhagen does. So you can't design a test to definitively say, aha, parallel worlds. It remains for many an interpretation rather than a directly testable theory. And the sheer number of universes. That bothers people, too. It does. Philosophically, some find it just extravagant mm. and ontological excess, you might say. Too many universes to feel comfortable with. Plus Everett himself, his personality, his withdrawal from academia. That didn't help initially. He didn't really fight for his ideas in the academic arena after that early rejection. Left them in the shatters for a bit. Yeah, for quite a long time. But despite all that, the initial rejection, the philosophical hurdles what's his lasting legacy? What did he ultimately give us? I think his legacy is genuinely profound. The many worlds interpretation has fundamentally changed how many physicists think about quantum mechanics. It offers this complete deterministic picture of reality, even if it's a strange one. And the practical side. And it really has inspired and provided maybe a better conceptual framework for quantum information technology, quantum computing especially. It helps make sense of why these machines might work. So it's both a philosophical shift and a practical inspiration. I think so. Mm. And maybe most importantly, his story is just a powerful reminder, isn't it? That huge breakthroughs often come from someone daring to question everything, to follow an idea that seems crazy at first. Yeah. To stick with intellectual honesty, even when it leads you way outside the mainstream. Precisely. It's a testament to bold, unconventional thinking. What an incredible journey into Hugh Everett III's mind and work. It really underscores how science moves forward sometimes with ideas that seem almost unbelievable initially. Absolutely. His life and work, and Jurgo Schnepet's essay, really brings this out. It's not just about a different picture of the universe. It's also, you know, an inspiration. Think differently. Question assumptions. A great reminder. For anyone wanting to delve deeper, you can find more insights and explore the resources mentioned in Jurgo Schnepet's original essay. Mm -hmm. Check out his website for the essay and more information. That's schneppet.di. Well worth exploring. Thank you for joining us on this quantum deep dive. Until next time, keep exploring those hidden realities.